All right, thank you for having me. And yeah, so today my talk is going to be looking at the specifically the forecasting of uh, the impacts of aerosol impacts on the forecasting of the Hurricane Harvey as it made landfall using the UFS model. Uh, this is a UAlbany EMC collaborative effort uh, with my colleagues listed below. So I just want to thank them. Uh, quick, quick, quick overview here, just a little bit of motivation on why looking at aerosol impacts on hurricanes, uh, and then go into the purpose of my study, talk about briefly the experiment, and then look at some preliminary results and then provide a summary. But I'm also gonna give a quick UFS experience because I'm typically more versed in WARF, and uh, so this is kind of my first time using UFS. So um, really quick on the motivation, uh, in terms of the aerosol impacts, aerosol radiation, and aerosol cloud feedbacks, there's many, the literature is rich in terms of their effects on tropical cyclones. This includes Saharan dust, sea salt, organic and uh, black carbon. And here's a few just studies that I have in terms of just aerosols can affect the intensity, they can affect the dynamic and uh, convective structures, the track, as well as the genesis. Um, in terms of uh, the focus of this study, uh, it was on Hurricane Harvey, and the literature's just starting to come out with uh, people looking at aerosol impacts. And obviously this uh, hurricane was selected because of its significance to uh, our hitting us in 2017. So the purpose of the study specifically focused here is to examine the aerosol cloud feedback on the forecasting of Hurricane Harvey as it made landfall and using the UFS model. And um, the physics suite I use is a modified Seesaw MG physics suite. Um, so this is kind of highlighting just some of the, the differences or uh, modifications that we've made. Uh, for example, for the radiation, uh, typically aerosol attenuation is determined by the OPAC climatology, but there was an option to include go-kart aerosols. Uh, similarly, we use the Morrison-Gettleman uh, two-moment bulk scheme, and uh, there was an option also to include for uh, go-kart aerosols for the CCN and IN activation. Uh, for the aerosols that we specifically use, uh, we use the MARA-2 aer uh, aerosol reanalysis. Uh, the go-kart uh, aerosol specs, including their size distribution and optical properties, uh, follow from GEOS 5, and they are currently operational in the NGAG version 2 and will be ported to the uh, GEFS aerosol ensemble member. Uh, but again, we're using just the uh, climatological averages from 23rd, uh, to, which are monthly average from 20, 2003 to 2014. But uh, anyway, much of the code development that I'm kind of mentioning here uh, re results from a uh, collaborative effort between U Albany, uh, GSFC, and NSEP. And so I just want to, you know, give them a nod in terms of uh, getting this work out because it allows me to simply just flip a switch to run my experiments. And I'll, these are the two experiments that I'm going to focus on. We looked at a variety of experiments, including just using the GFS for 16 physics, but I'm not going to present that. Here, we're going to just show two different cases. One, where we allow the CCN activation, this is the control case, to just be temperature dependent. So in, in essence, there has been no inf aerosol information on the uh, CCN IN activation. Whereas in the aerosol case I'm calling here, the CCN IN activation is deter uh, determined via this the climatological MER2 aerosols. For both cases, the radiation aerosol attenuation is determined by the MER2 aerosols as well. I grabbed the initial conditions from the GFS analysis, and then these were 10-day forecasts that I initialized four days before Harvey made landfall, which is around uh, August 22nd, 2017. So here's an animation of the two cases. Overlaid here in the black dot is the uh, best track from Harvey, and uh, this goes from basically hour to uh, zero to 150. So uh, controls on the left, aerosols on the right. So you can see there's disorganization in the first uh, 50 hours, but there's somewhat uh, similar in structure. And then you can see a track deviation occur about right here. I don't know if your screen is showing the same animation time frame as I am uh, that you're hearing this, but uh, you can see that for the control case, which is on the left, the, the blue contours begin to veer to the west of the black line, a uh, black dot, whereas the uh, aerosol case veers to the uh, east to the right. I have the uh, snapshot here so you can kind of get an idea of the differences. So as I mentioned here for the control case in this in this run you can see that uh, it makes its landfall to the south and west of the actual best track and then stays west and where it dies out. Whereas for the aerosol case again just changing the uh, aerosol activation, CCNINF activation, it, it hits to the northeast 
relative to the best track, and also heads east. So in terms of you know comparing it to Harvey, which you know made this really complicated uh, landfall, hit the middle of Texas coastline, then hairpinned out of uh, of Texas, and then came back over towards South Louisiana. You know the track is going in in the same direction with the aerosol case, but it's much faster than what you know, and it's not picking up this complicated structure that. Uh, the best track fit, uh, picked up. Similarly, on the right here, you can see the intensity uh, as a function of time using the min sea level pressure. And so for the aerosol case, we did see that the it was slightly more intense as it made uh, at landfall and during landfall. But the best track or uh, you know, observations from HERDAT showed that the, the actual pressure sea, uh, mean sea level pressure for Harvey was 937. This is because, which is much obviously uh, lower than these values. This is because Harvey underwent a rapid intensification event 24 hours before it made landfall. And a lot of the models at this initialization time were not picking that up um, at this time. So uh, you'd have to go later into the initialize later to kind of pick that up. Uh, we also quickly looked at the OLR just to get a sense of the uh, high cloud tops and convection. And here's the two uh, difference as they made landfall, the stars are representing the location of the center, uh, storm center. And so you can see there's you know high cloud tops around the storm center near the eye wall. And then there's also this convective branch on the eastern side of the storm. But for the aerosol case, it appears on this east side that they're, the cloud tops are higher, indicating broader and potentially deeper convection. Lining that up with the GOES IR overlaid on uh, the same time, pulling that from WPC, there was this, uh, from the brightness temperatures, you do see a cold cloud tops on the eastern side of the storm. So this is qualitatively uh, kind of lining up more with the aerosol case. Now, so again, these are preliminary results and uh, they're kind of demonstrating that this air cloud, aerosol cloud feedback using MER2 climate aerosols can affect the forecasting of Harvey. You know, we're seeing intensification in the storm, slightly um, a different shack and uh, some different changes in the convective structure. Um, obviously these are encouraging, but they do warrant further analysis using more uh, you know, process-based diagnostic tools for verification and validation. Potentially one option is to look at MET Plus that uh, our moderator, uh, Lindsay, uh, talked about yesterday. But uh, there's also, if there's any other potentially diagnostics that any of the community can uh, share with me, then you know, I'd be happy to reach out on Slack or contact me via email. And finally, I just wanted to talk briefly about my UFS experience. So this is a UAlbany project, uh, funded project, and um, so, and as I mentioned, I'm primarily more well-versed in WARF, and so here's a kind of a timeline showing the uh, my experience and then kind of setting up my uh, project, and it includes running the first two graduate student tests, and then uh, to kind of spin up on the way UFS was run, then updating uh, with the physics suite, and then running my cases, but I just want to thank the UFS uh, developers for allowing me to Okay, thank you. I just want to thank the U.S. developers for allowing uh, the pro providing the graduate student tests because all these experiments were conducted on Cheyenne, and of course, I also want to thank my collaborators for helping me with uh, the feedback of running and interpreting these results. And so, with that, thank you. All right. Any any questions for Dustin? Yes, there are two on Slack. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first is from Benjamin Green, and the question is: Do you plan ensemble tests given low predictability of Harvey? Yeah, it'd be something that would be certainly uh, interesting to do, and I'd be certainly interested in doing ensemble uh, testing for that. I know that when it comes to Met Plus, that's one of the ways in which we can start to uh, better understand um, uncertainty and model error, especially with these cases. So it's something I'm very uh, I'd be open to. All right. And then there is a second question from Evan Kalina, which is, what is the difference in the number of CCN activated in the CTL versus aerosol runs? Yeah, or, it's a really, is the sorry, sorry. Sorry. or is the primary <laughs> difference the aerosol type or some other property? Yeah, um, so when it comes to the CCN uh, activate, uh, sorry, the number of concentrations, they are different. Um, in terms of, you know, I haven't quite dug in too deep in terms of looking at the differences, uh, but I know that the idea here is that the 
their aerosol information is out for the control cases. It's just temperature dependent, whereas the um, control case uses the aerosols for act, uh, nucleation activation. And so we could talk more offline with some of my collaborators who uh, set that up uh, to get more information. All right, thank you. Those are all the questions on Slack. All right, thank you, Dr. Yep. Our next speaker is Evelyn Grell from Sirius. Evelyn, are you ready? Yes. As a reminder, if you are not presenting or moderating or chairing, please turn off your video. Evelyn, are you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? It's really, really uh, low. OK. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, but you're still kind of low on the volume. Okay. Maybe you're away from your speaker or something. I'll try to speak up. All right. Thank you. Uh, if you go to uh, present mode, that will be great. Yeah. I will disappear. Okay, so this talk addresses the behavior of two microphysics schemes when aerosols are included and interact with the microphysical processes. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, okay, so many previous studies have shown that aerosols do have an impact on meteorology. Just We just saw that in the last presentation. Um, but the effects are complicated. We have direct effects, indirect effects, semi-direct effects. In this talk, I'm only going to address aerosol microphysics interactions, the, the indirect effects, and their impact on short range weather forecasts. Um, because aerosol content is also not always very well known, we're also trying to get an idea of how accurate the aerosol content needs to be in the forecast model. So we looked at the impact of including aerosols and then varying the aerosol content on two different microphysics parameterizations. And we actually used the WARF model for this studies and we used the Thompson and Morrison microphysics schemes. And even though we use the WARF model, I, I think these results are still applicable because um, both of these microphysics schemes are available in the CCPP and can be used in the UFS. And in fact, um, the Thompson scheme which is one that we used, um, is one of the candidates for further development for possible operational use. So the Thompson microphysics scheme includes an aerosol aware option. So for a fair comparison of the response of the schemes, I implemented this aerosol package from the aerosol package that's in the Thompson scheme. I implemented it in the Morrison scheme. And then we did two sets of idealized simulations, um, a 2D squall line and a 3D shallow convection case. But due to time constraints, I'm only going to be showing results from the squall line case today. Now, these idealized setups do not include radiation, so we can't quantify the direct and semi-direct effects. This is a much simpler setup than what you saw in the last presentation. Our, our focus is just on the microphysics effects. Um, so the aerosol component was developed by Greg Thompson and Trude Eidhammer and includes equations for the prediction of number concentration for cloud water, as well as two types of aerosols, which are termed water friendly and ice friendly. And we use default idealized profiles of the aerosols, which are height dependent. We have sources and sinks, including activation, wet scavenging, and restoration of the available aerosols if evaporation takes place. And there's also a surface source term for the water-friendly aerosols. So this slide shows the squalline structure with and without aerosols for the two schemes at three hours into the simulation. The colors are theta E, the white lines are perturbation potential temperature. 
Um, using the Morrison scheme, you can see that the front propagates slightly faster with the inclusion of aerosols. With the Thompson scheme, there's not much difference in the, top, in the propagation speed, but we see a broader and shallower cold pool when the aerosols are included. Um, since the strength of the cold pool is strongly related to the amount of cooling due to evaporation, this indicates some differences in the microphysical processes. Uh, we also see a reduction in the precipitation in both schemes. The, the graph on the bottom right there is at, at one hour uh, forecast time. So you see a reduction in the precipitation in both schemes. And that's not surprising because there are more smaller particles and it takes more time to develop them into raindrops. Um, we can also see that the two schemes are actually more different from each other than the due to aerosols. So then we change the aerosol content by plus or minus 20%. And I realize this is a very small difference considering the uncertainty in actual aerosols, but it, it was a starting point. So the top panel show the results with a decrease of aerosols and at the bottom you see an increase by 20%. So not surprisingly, the impact is small, but we do see some differences in the cold pool indicating some changes in the microphysical processes. Um, also, there's some small changes in the timing and location of precipitation. Um, but again, the difference between the schemes is greater than the difference due to aerosols. And this difference between the schemes is even more apparent if we look at the distribution of hydrometeors. Um, the most obvious difference being in the distribution of snow, which is the gold-colored contours out ahead of the simulated gust front. So we don't include radiation in these idealized runs, but a difference like this in the snow would certainly be expected to lead to a response from the radiation as well. Um, now the top panels are with the decreased aerosol and the bottom panels are with increased aerosols. Um, in terms of differences due to aerosols, um, probably the main difference is in the distribution of the Graupel, which is the red lines. You can see that it seems more um, compressed in the higher aerosol runs. So if we dig a little deeper into the microphysics differences and go back to the very early times, um, we looked at some of the key terms in the budgets for the formation of cloud water. And these are vertical pro profiles of domain average process terms with the Thompson scheme shown in blue and the Morrison in red. So the 80% aerosol runs are the solid lines and the 120% aerosol runs are the dashed lines. So at 10 minutes on the left, the condensation in the upper left corner which is the main production process for cloud water is occurring at almost the same rate in both schemes, but the auto conversion rates, and that's the rate at which the cloud droplets collide and coalesce until they're large enough to be recategorized as raindrops. Um, so you can see that the Thompson scheme is converting the cloud water to rainwater a lot more quickly than the Morrison scheme. And as a result, then the Thompson scheme has less cloud water because more has been converted to rain compared to the Morrison scheme. So, and you can also see that at this time, the increase in aerosols had a stronger impact on the Morrison simulations with less auto conversion, which in turn decreases the rate of accretion, which is a collection of the cloud drops by the falling raindrops. Um, a little bit later though, at 30 minutes shown on the right, when the system is a little more developed and there are more microphysical processes active, including those for frozen hydrometeors, it becomes clear that there are more differences between the schemes than between the runs with differing aerosol content, given this 20% difference. So the differences between the schemes are due to two different things. There's different formulations, for the parameterization of some of these individual process terms. And there's also different assumptions about the size of the hydrometeors. Um, so if we look at the one hour average of the processes for rain production for the two schemes, 
some of the differences help us understand why the squall line is evolving a little differently. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. We know that evaporation, which is the red line, is important in the, the temperature budget, which leads to the cold pool formation. So the greater amount of evaporation in the Thompson scheme, especially near the ground, is contributing to the shallower and faster moving cold pool that we see in this simulation. Um, and just briefly, the, the drop size distributions for rain are, are shown here. And you can see the, the Morrison scheme allows a broader range of raindrop sizes compared to the Thompson scheme. And there are larger numbers of very small drops in the Morrison scheme. So to summarize, um, differences between the two microphysics schemes are greater than the differences due to varying the aerosol load by just 20%. However, aerosol variations of this magnitude are sufficient to lead to differences in the microphysical properties and the precipitation amount, which should lead to changes in the radiative response. And the differences between the schemes are largely due to different size-dependent process parameterizations and assumptions of the hydrometeor size distributions. Um, because there's a lot of uncertainty and the best way to parameterize these processes. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, any questions? Um, there isn't a question, but there is a comment. Uh, do we have time to do that or do we need to move on? Um, well, let's go ahead. Okay, so the comment is from Ted Mansell, and he says, some tests we did about two years ago with the Thompson climatological aerosols didn't show much radiation effect, at least in terms of air temperature in the boundary layer on the short term of three to six hours. So that's just a comment. Okay. All right, um, thank you again, Evelyn. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Hannah Barnes from CIRS. Hannah, are you ready? Yes. All right, can you see everything? Yes, I will disappear here. All right. Um, so hello, I, there's a lot of aspects of the Grell for Test cumulus parameterization that is under development. Um, many of those activities are done by my collaborators, um, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk about one project that I've been working on that's geared at improving the treatment of aerosol cloud interactions in GF. So based on the previous two talks, it's pretty clear we've now seen that aerosols impact weather. However, I want to uh, emphasize for this talk one of the one types of, of the ways it impacts weather, and that's the aerosol indirect effect where aerosols impact the characteristics of the cloud, such as precipitation efficiency and cloud lifetime. Now, aerosols are most often included in climate models than medium range models, but either case, convective parameterizations usually do not include aerosol impacts. They're usually in terms of radiation parameterizations or microphysics, and very little has been done in convection. However, since the convective parameterizations control thing, have a role in precipitation efficiency and cloud lifetime, it seems like this would be a area of opportunity to develop convective parameterizations. So the Grell for Task Cumulus Parameterization has been working, uh, has been classified as an aerosol aware scheme since it was first published in 2014. At that time it was considered a scale aware and aerosol aware. When it was first introduced in terms of aerosols, they used a very simple approach that they said that the aerosol pollution could be represented by aerosol optical depth and then that aerosol optical depth was used to estimate a cloud condensation nuclei concentration field uh, using methods as in Rosenfeld 2018 and Andrea 2018 and they also assumed a vertical distribution of CCN that was uniform and Admittedly, this is a very simple approach. However, when this was first done, there was a lot of uncertainty about how these processes would impact the parameterization, and they also didn't want to drastically change the behavior. So they made assumptions that um, basically the environment of the aerosols was going to be relatively clean, 
um, so it wouldn't impact results too significantly. And it's worth noting that um, in future work, we want to test out different ways to initialize aerosols in GF using, for example, using more realistic vertical distributions. But once they had the aerosols in GF, they included them in three processes in the scheme. First, they added it, added aerosol effects to the auto conversion of cloud water to cloud rain, and they also added it to the evaporation efficiency of rain. And they also added one additional process, which is wet scavenging of aerosols. And so when I show you some results later, when I say a baseline, this is kind of what we're gonna, I'm gonna be referencing to in the I did a series of an ensemble of runs up to 240 hours, and the baseline is results showing the standard GF scheme. Uh, but my work has been updating the scheme. So one of the biggest things that I've done is now the aerosol optical depth in GF can be initialized using NASA's MARA2 reanalysis fields of total aerosol optical depth. So on this right panel here, you see differences between the aerosol optical depth for the updated version of GF and the original. And you can see, especially in Africa and in um, Asia, you're seeing a lot more aerosol optical depth and thus GF will have more CCN in these regions. Um, so this is a much more realistic horizontal distribution. I've also added those same aerosol processes to congestus clouds and I've updated how CCN is wet scavenged in the model or the scheme. Now I'm using a method that's similar to what is used in um, CAM5 in which CCN scavenging is proportional to the precipitation efficiency. So next I'm gonna transition and start showing you a few results. Um, however, one caveat is gonna be that these are very preliminary. There's still several things we wanna work on in aerosols and GF, and we've also just started to get these results. So the analysis is not fully complete, but we'll give you a little glimpse of what we're starting to see. So to start with, I wanna focus on an area, or the Atlantic Ocean in Africa, um, because we know the new updated version has much stronger aerosols in this region. So if we start by looking over here on the left side, the colors are the 700 hectopascal temperature differences. And if you look closely, this is Africa outlined right here. And then the, blue, or the green lines, which are a little hard to see, um, they are the, um, uh, the areas of high AOD. So their contour is a 0.3 and 0.5 AOD. And what stands out in this figure is this large blue area um, in the Atlantic and just off the just near the coast of Africa. And this is cooling of about a half a degree K um, Kelvin. So that's fairly significant cooling. And we wanted to think a little bit about why this might happen. And our theory right now is related to the fact that um, the auto conversion of cloud water to rain in, the, in GF is influenced by aerosols. So in the updated GF runs, there's a lot more aerosols in this region. So it means there's gonna be the rain or the cloud drops are gonna be a lot smaller. So auto conversion is gonna occur more slowly. So we'd expect to see more cloud water in this region. And that's confirmed by this middle panel. It's a vertical profile, so pressure and then cloud water mixing ratio. The blue line is the updated GF runs and the orange line is the original. And this is averaged over this area in the, over the Atlantic and Africa. And you can see at 700, especially as you go up, there's a lot more uh, cloud water mixing ratio in the updated GF version. And also it's interesting to note that the map on the right shows the difference in mid-level cloud fraction and you see a lot more reds. So this updated version of GF has more, the simulation with it has more mid-level clouds. So our theory right now of why we're seeing clear, or cooling is one, there's more cloud water, so there's more evaporation, so evaporative cooling. And then there's also more cloud cover, which could also attribute to cooling. So this is just a region that we expect to be highly influenced. What happens when we look at the entire globe? What's interesting is we actually do see some clear um, global impacts of these changes. On the left here, I'm showing the 500 hectopascal temperature differences. 
And if you focus here in the uh, tropical Pacific and the Indian Ocean, you see quite consistent warming. Um, and again, we're thinking this is also related to changes in the auto conversion of cloud water to rain. Uh, this map over here shows cloud water mixing ratio differences. And you do see that there's a tendency to have more red areas in the tropics than blue, suggesting there's more cloud water. However, remember that this temperature map is now at 500, which especially in the tropics is near or at freezing. So we're thinking right now that there's more um, freezing, so more latent heat release, which may attribute to the warming. But again, the caveat with these two slides is that this is still relatively preliminary work. Um, so to briefly summarize, um, we're currently, this project is focused on updating the treatment of aerosols in the GF scheme. Um, the main mm -hmm. things we've done so far is we introduced a method to more realistically initialize aerosols um, in a horizontal sense, or horizontal distribution. We've added aerosol effects to congested clouds and updated the wet scavenging of aerosols. Um, early results suggest that the temperature, cloud water, and cloud fraction um, are impacted both regionally and globally. And there's several avenues of future work we wanna do. In terms of aerosols and GF, we wanna add aerosol effects to the shallow clouds. Also, um, oftentimes the GF scheme is coupled with the Thompson aerosol aware and microphysical parameterization, like we saw in the previous talk, or not like, but as we saw. Um, however, the aerosol fields in GF and in the Thompson scheme are not the same. Um, so we want to try to add some consistency, and that will likely require us making some more realistic CCN profiles in GF um, using 3D profiles instead of 2D. And aerosols aren't the only aspect of GF that's being um, developed. Uh, other activities we've recently worked on is we've used down drafts to help cold pool propagation. This was done in the wharf, but we would like to add this to FB3. And also we've been talking more about using GF at higher horizontal resolutions, for example, three kilometers. Um, and this has really brought to the forefront that we need to revisit the scale awareness and maybe develop some different methods, possibly using different stochastic methods um, so that we can use GF effectively at those lower resolution or higher resolutions. Um, so I think, I am, thank you, and I can take questions if there's time. And we have time for maybe one question. Uh, there aren't any questions on the Slack channel. All right, thank you. We'll move on. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Lisa Benson from NOAA PSL. Lisa, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um... Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so this um, work is done together with some colleagues at NOAA Astro PSL as listed here. Um, since I have very little time, I'm gonna dive straight into some background. Uh, as you know, convectively um, coupled waves uh, in the atmosphere um, it can be organized over a range of different scales. Um, so in the tropics, um, you can see coherent wave-like disturbances that's co uh, coupled to convection on synoptic scales and can often be tracked for, for days or even weeks. Uh, and modeling these disturbances is, is challenging in DCMs with the current operational horizontal resolution. Uh, so the figure on the left here shows a whole Miller diagram uh, over 90 days of observed precipitation from spring of 2016. And you can see mainly eastward propagation uh, of convective clusters uh, averaged over the tropical belt uh, uh, with the varying uh, phase speeds. So this right figure here uh, shows the era interim space time spectra of the coherence uh, or the relationship, if you will, uh, between low-level convergence and precipitation. 
Uh, and this figure suggests that along known equatorial wave modes, and uh, uh, for this period in particular, so it's, it's computed over this period that I'm showing here, uh, for the Kelvin wave band, there's a strong coherence between dynamics and, and precipitation, uh, indicated by more, more red here. So I'm going to talk about trying to improve upon this type of, of organization. Um, so in, in GCMs, uh, convection is typically represented using a bulk mass flux approach, uh, where the whole range of individual subgrid convective plumes um, in a grid box is represented using a sort of one-dimensional uh, and training the training plume model. Uh, and these schemes consist mainly of three building blocks. We have the uh, trigger, which determines wh where and when to initiate convection. Uh, the cloud model, which models how convection will feed back to the environment. Um, and then there's the closure criteria, which, which is essentially sort of the regulation of the amount of convection by, by the grid scale variables. So this concept of representing all subgrid scale uh, fluctuations arising from convection in a grid box in terms of a mean updraft, it comes from the assumption that uh, the grid box is much, much larger uh, than the process that we want to model um, in a way that they can uh, be assumed to be modeled in a statistical sense uh, and that there's an assumed statistical equilibrium uh, between the large scale environment and all, uh, um, all of the plumes occurring in, in a grid box. Uh, as we go to higher and higher resolution, this assumption is, uh, is no longer valid and we have to consider the st stochastic nature of the processes because now each grid box could consist of, uh, say, only one or, or two or, or many um, or no convective plumes. Also, in the current uh, operational GFS, there's no distinction whether a grid box consists of, of several small plumes um, or are organized into to one, uh, say one large plume, uh, and ar arguably the large scale environment would respond differently in these two situations. Uh, so in this work, what we propose is to model this type of, of subgrid uh, and also cross grid uh, organization um, in a stochastic manner using cellular automata. The cellular automata is a finite model and it exhibits um, self-organization in uh, uh, and um, I guess, um, um, yeah, I have this schematic image here uh, trying to, to show, uh, so, so the gray lines here is the, would represent the NWP model and, and the fine lines would be the cellular automata grid. And uh, so in this work, we, we run the CA on a higher resolution than the, the model grid, and you can have this self-organization across adjacent model grid boxes. And we condition the CA on uh, co convective rain evaporation as a proxy for areas where, um, where the model would have uh, a chance of having a subgrid organization due to cold pool dynamics. Uh, and then uh, we let the convection scheme respond differently in terms of, of, of the triggering in a nearby environment, the entrainment and closure, depending uh, on the amount of subgrid organization or cross-grid organization. Um, so we ran several forecasts in uh, atmosphere only version of the UFS at uh, 25 kilometer resolution using GFS version 15. Uh, point two physics. Um, and there's a large uh, uncertainty associated with these forecasts. Beyond two weeks, all, all predictability is really lost. Uh, so in this work, we're interested in more in the statistical behavior of, of the model's ability to propagate and initiate convectively coupled equatorial waves. Uh, so we run ensembles of forecasts for this pur purpose. So a, a, a convenient way of summarizing the Whole Miller diagrams in a statistical sense is to compute the so called Radon projection uh, plots. So, here um, the precipitation um, 
uh, variance along different phase speed lines are computed uh, both in the eastward and westward direction. And the gray line here uh, shows the trim observation. Uh, you can see a peak in the precipitation variance um, in the eastward propagating waves at about 15 meters per second phase speeds. And these are uh, phase speeds associated with equatorial Kelvin waves. And the reference configuration um, of, of the model uh, that are uh, simulated here by the blue lines, um, they managed to capture uh, the the variance in the eastward propagation quite well, but it's it's um, quite slow, uh, uh, or the maximum phase speed is, is slower than the observed uh, variance phase speed. Uh, when we apply the CA uh, on the uh, closure and entrainment, we don't see a, a very large impact of the scheme, but uh, when the CA is allowed to modulate, mo uh, modify grid points where we trigger convection and introduces this memory and also uh, larger scales uh, in a nearby environment, then um, the phase speed uh, of, uh, of the waves is sped up and it matches better with the observations. Uh, in comparison, you can see if we perturb at random the tendencies in the st uh, stochastic perturb physics tendency scheme, uh, some members speed up, some members slow down. Uh, there's no uh, systematic impact of the scheme. Um, I don't have time to show this today, but, uh, but the, some previous study have noted that there's a linear relationship between um, a quantity called the gross moist stability and Kelvin wave phase speed. And we've done some analysis of, of this gross moist stability in this study, and we show uh, that there is an increase in, in this quantity with yes. the CA scheme. Two sorry? Two minutes, sorry. Okay, All right. yeah, I'm gonna um, speed up here. Yes, yeah, so, so we think that the, the speed up in Kelvin wave can be related to, to the changes in the stability uh, of the atmosphere. Uh, just Briefly, uh, looking at the space-time spectra of the relationship between low-level convergence and precipitation, again, also suggests that the introduction of the CA convection uh, initiation scheme um, that I showed down here, it, it brings the model runs a bit closer to what you find in the reanalysis. Uh, and it's, that is less coherent with the dynamics along the equatorial wave modes. Uh, and it may be that there's too much large scale precipitation in the reference configuration, uh, which is too uh, closely tied to the dynamics. Um, and that could also be why the model simulation with SPPT uh, now actually makes the coherence even slightly more red in, uh, than the reference, because in this case, uh, the convective tendencies in some members are significantly reduced over large areas and long time periods, uh, causing a, a shift to, to more large scale precip. Uh, so I can leave my summary and conclusion slide up and uh, perhaps take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions? No, there are no questions in the Slack channel. All right, we will move on. Our next speaker is Benjamin Green from Cirrus. Benjamin, are you ready? Um, I'm trying to get uh, the presentation pulled up just a second here. Oh, Lisa, you need to stop sharing your screen so Benjamin can share his screen. Oh, here we go. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. And there's no issues with the size or anything? If you can go to presentation mode. Oh, yeah. Let's try this. There we go. We good? It's still kind of small. Uh, there we go. OK, we're good? Yes. All right. Um, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, you can see my title. I want to thank my co-authors, uh, Shanson and George Groh. And um, so this is really like the beginning 
ongoing uh, work on UFS for subseason applications. And there already have been several, and there will be even more talks on subseasonal applications for UFS at this workshop. And I want to highlight the 1230 Eastern session tomorrow is just one that has a lot of um, subseasonal talks. Uh, the development of the coupled UFS for subseasonal to seasonal prediction, it is progressing quite rapidly and involves um, the FE3, including CCPP physics. And I'll note that CCPP was added to the coupled UFS framework only four months ago. Um, it includes an ocean model, a sea ice model, which will soon be upgraded, um, a wave model, which I will note was only added two months ago, and a mediator, uh, which couples all of these component models together. And I'll note that the mediator will also soon be replaced. So in other words, this uh, subseasonal UFS is a very fast moving target. So I wanna give this important disclaimer that the results that I'm gonna present in a few slides are not representative of the current system. And we plan to run these tests again um, once things have slowed down a little bit. Um, so VJ uh, showed, um, someone called it the rainbow diagram um, here. And uh, the, the streamlining of operational models, you know, has been talked about. The one thing I kind of do wanna point out um, is that the uh, current um, seasonal climate model, uh, the CFS V2, is what is being used today operationally for the subseasonal range. And so I kind of added this red line here that the 45 day forecast will be moving um, to uh, the GEFS uh, system. And so if we're putting one to 45 day forecasts all on the same single UFS based model, i.e. guess, um, it should be you know, overall a good thing, but there's a new challenge, which is to ensure that this model has what I call reasonable scale from daily to subseasonal time scales. So uh, in terms of physics development, uh, this provides opportunities and challenges and opportunities under the CCP framework, um, we can very easily swap parameterizations, which allows for robust A-B testing, not only of individual schemes, but also entire physics suites. And we can also do what I call cross-purpose testing of schemes and suites. So how well does a physics suite that was initially developed in tune for, say, short-range regional mesoscale forecasting perform globally at subseasonal time scales. And this particular bullet point is the focus of this talk. And um, it can also facilitate uh, the development of schemes and suites that are intended to work across spatial temporal scales. Um, in the challenges, you actually notice that the first bullet point is also under opportunities um, because uh, you, as I say in the second bullet point, as you consolidate across space and time, um, you're widening the range of stakeholder needs. You're bringing more people to the table and you have to satisfy, you have to optimize to more applications. And it's, as everyone knows, it's harder to make more people happy and more compromise may be required. Um, so mesoscale physics for subseasonal forecasts, you may be asking. So um, our lab uh, has been a leader in high resolution, rapidly updating regional me mesoscale modeling uh, for decades, including the ROC, the RAP, and the HER. And GSL has developed and fine tuned a suite of physics uh, parameterizations, which goes by many names uh, that you've seen throughout this workshop. I will be calling it, uh, to be politically correct, the RRFS uh, suite. Um, some components of this suite are listed here and you've seen talks already in this session about some of these. Um, and the goal of this talk is really to take a first look at how this suite performs in global UFS at subseasonal time scales. So the experimental design, we use these two physics suites, both of which are within the CCPP framework. And um, I note this is because the RRFS suite was only, is really only capable of being run with CCPP. And so what I call the GFS suite was what was operational uh, GFS physics in July of 2019. And this version of the so-called RFS suite uh, was from GSL from July of 2019. And we perform atmosphere only 
runs. And you'll say, why uncouple? Uncoupled, especially for those of you who are knowledgeable of subseasonal forecasting. You know, we need to have coupling uh, for subseasonal forecast, get the MJO and other things uh, right. But as I said, um, because RRFS was only available, is only available in C uh, uh, via CCPP, and coupled UFS only became capable of using CCPP very recently, uh, we weren't able to get an exhaustive set of run out in time. Um, we will, we are just about to do that again. Um, in fact, so we have 208 cases for each of these two physics suites that we initialized uh, weekly from January of 2015 through December of 2018. And the resolution with vertical levels um, is also listed here. So, okay, so quickly to some results. On the left panel are week one results, days one through seven. On the right are week four results, uh, days 21 to 28. And what we verified, we chose to verify here against operational GFS analysis, which admittedly may give an uh, advantage to the GFS physics suite. Um, but basically what we wanted to look for, just what are the spatial errors over uh, these cases? And also uh, what are the biases aggregated over the globe? And the main points I wanted to draw here for two meter temperature biases, uh, the biggest differences between the two suites are over icy areas, uh, Antarctica and Greenland. And we don't really know what the truth is. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, and then in week one, um, GFS has warm biases, whereas the RFS uh, seems to have cold biases. And that's uh, shown here in this table where I averaged over all of the land points. And if we move to week four here on the right, uh, we find if we look at the last row of this table that over the land points, um, the two suites have the same mean biases over land, which is actually quite remarkable. And they're both a warm bias. I will note that the RRFS has a larger model drift. In other words, how does the first week uh, results change compared to the uh, week four results? And so I will also say that despite identical SST, uh, these are uncoupled. Uh, we still see some slight differences in two meter uh, temperature biases over the ocean. And moving on to precip here, we are now choosing to verify against uh, ERA-5. You know, everyone has their favorite precip uh, product. I will just acknowledge that. Um, and in the table here, I've now just chosen to take global averages over both land and ocean. So the, the layout is the same as in the last slide. And what we see in week one is that the RRFS in this middle left panel uh, is much wider than GFS, mainly mm -hmm. due to biases at high two levels. Uh, is there a question? No, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah, almost done. Um, and uh, GFS also does have a wet bias looking at this table. Uh, if we look at week four, uh, we actually see in the table that according uh, against ERA-5, the RFS is a small wet bias. Uh, both suites drift towards less precip. Um, but the RFS has a larger model drift. So I'm just going to say, to summarize, uh, as you know, there's this plan to streamline all global forecast products on lead times from 0 to 45 days into a single model. Um, and this plan, it provides an impetus to evaluate the subseasonal performance of a uh, high-resolution mesoscale physics suite. And uh, this first test of this physics suite at subseasonal time scales, found what I would say are comparable results to what was then operational physics, which is actually quite remarkable. Um, so, future work is to update both physics sets to their newer versions and then also to test with couplings. So, thank you very much. Now, I'll stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you, Ben. Any, any questions for Ben? Uh, there are no questions in the Slack channel. All right, let's move ahead with the last speaker. Our, is, our next speaker is Joseph Olson from NOAA ESL. Joseph, are you ready? Uh, or will be soon. Let me know when you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Okay, 
should go into slide mode. Let me swap displays. Is that better? Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank my co-authors, uh, specifically Wei Zhang, Zhang for his uh, expertise in this uh, surface layer topic. I'm going to overview the motivation for this new integrated surface layer scheme and present uh, a subset of the new features here. I'm going to focus mostly on iterative procedure, the flux profile relationships, and the thermal roughness links. But just to note that there's a lot more development going on here that I won't be able to touch upon. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples of some of uh, the differences that can, or the impact of some of these components. And I'll summarize at the end. So the motivation that was kind of nicely laid out by Neil Jacobs at the first talk of this workshop. But so this is just like one little piece of that pie. Uh, we're trying to build a, a surface layer scheme that could tap into the expertise and one another surface layer schemes in the global and regional and other hurricane stuff. So ultimately, we want to get like the best of greatest hits put into all of this uh, the surface layer scheme that could at least serve as a nice testing vehicle uh, for comparing I mean, more apples to apples away these uh, various subcomponents. We'll take what works the best, uh, try to combine it the best we can, and uh, at the same time ensure this has perfect connectivity or coupling to other model components for all foreseeable applications. So as of right now, the surface layer scheme has these two variables, IZ not land and uh, I surface flux option, which control the surface roughness lengths over land and water. Now these aren't nameless variables right now, they're actually hard coded in the wrapper as of right now. I could make them into nameless variables if we want uh, later on. If you don't mess with them, you're going to just get the default her bulk, bulk flux formulations, which uses uh, Zilatinkevich over land and the uh, core 3.0 over, over, over water. Now, there's a, there's a, a bunch of other uh, things I put in here for uh, colleagues over the years, and I've just kind of kept them in there, but I could remove. I think a lot of this is just noise. Most importantly, though, I have ta recently pulled in the, the GFS parameterization. This is... Uh, Wei Zhang's work is green fraction uh, dependent uh, formulation for the roughness lengths, which he has nicely tuned up for both two meter temperatures and uh, surface temperatures as well. And I've also pulled in their bulk flux form formulations over water as well. Uh, so this is a good comparison vehicle already. Now I have two iterative solvers here um, in the scheme as of right now. I originally took the two-point secant method from uh, Jimenez and Dudia from their WARF revised surface layer scheme, but I adapted it because uh, in cases when your thermal roughness lengths aren't equivalent to your aerodynamic roughness lengths. And just to compare against it, you know, I put in a brute, a brute force method, which both of them basically iterate over this equation here to solve for Z, uh, Z over L, or the stability parameter. Um, but they do it in different ways. So the, the good thing is that they both always converge in the test cases, but out of pure paranoia, I put in a backup analytical calculation that's um, available. If the number of iterations exceeds 20, it'll kick in and just give you an approximate answer. Um, but I've never seen it actually used in my test cases. This is an example of for a, a certain uh, forecast, a single forecast actually, where, you know, so there's, for every x, y point at the surface, for every time step, you got to solve for z over l. So there's over a billion attempts. Um, so most of the time, it converges early on. Um, but, you know, I could say for the six iterations, will take care of 99.99% of the points in your domain uh, throughout your entire forecast. And that's true for both methods, actually. Uh, so there's really... Interesting, there's not that much difference, but where the number of iterations can uh, continue out to you know beyond 10, 15, as one of stable, uh, stable situations over land. That's interestingly, you don't get any, you don't get a whole lot of benefit from either technique. So uh, that's just something you have to put up with for now, um, apparently. But uh, the, the good news is that they both converge and they're both accurate 
Um, and they both have the same, I guess, limitations too. Um, mitigating concerns for this computational efficiency, though, we use lookup tables uh, for the flux profile relationships and pre-computed log and our tangent function. So this makes the iteration very fast. Even if they, you have to go up to 20 iterations, it, it's really fast. The benefit is just an accurate calculation of Z over L. Um, you know, as a function of Richardson number here for a variety of different land use uh, with uh, different uh, Z knots, like for over water, small values over over water versus um, forest and urban in the darker points. So you can see that, uh, and this is for a mosaic method actually. So there's actually a, a continuum of of Z knots. You know, so you don't have just discrete lines. But the point is here that you never get on physical values where Z or Z over L has a opposite sign of bulk Richardson number. So it works nicely and it's efficient. Um, options for flux uh, profile relationships. Here I'm plotting both the uh, the ones used in the wrap and her in green against the, the ones that are used in the GFS in blue. You can see there's a big difference in stable conditions, the magnitudes of these. Uh, so I'm, really interested in testing the potential benefits of both of those. Um, there's also a difference in the for the momentum in the, in the you know, slightly unstable uh, uh, regime as well. Don't know the ultimate impact of that yet, but that's just something to point out. Here's just an example of a 42-hour forecast uh, in, the, in the global framework where I'm looking at the sensible heat fluxes for both what, what's used in the HER versus the GFS. Overall, it doesn't look like that, that that big of a difference. But you know, if you take the diffs, you can see the biggest differences are in the really small, almost bare soil type areas or low vegetation, where the MYN or her type uh, bulk flux does produce larger sensible heat flux values. The opposite is true over water in these post cold front uh, regimes where you have high wind speeds, uh, generally cooler air flowing over a warmer sea. The, the GFS tends to give you a little bit larger uh, sensible heat fluxes in that situation. That's just something to note. They don't know which, which is right yet. Um, um, that's for further testing. But if you take an average over this block, over the East Conus, and look at the 48-hour time series, the differences here, you see there's not much difference at all for 10-meter winds. Uh, but the biggest differences are in latent heating, where the GFS formulation does seem to give you a little bit higher latent heat, which contributes to slightly more moist two meter mixing ratios. So in general, we have a higher, slightly higher Bowen ratio with the, with the herb bulk fluxes. Um, and we, so it would be interesting to test the, the exact GFS formulations within the HER and see if that can improve our warm dry bias we have in the summertime. One last thing I wanna highlight here is um, the application or the importance of the surface layer scheme for your wind over the lakes. And this is some work we've done in collaboration with the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, specifically Eric Anderson's uh, work here. Uh, just look at the top row of plots two, for now. Two minutes, two minutes Joseph. Gotcha, I'll be done in two. Um, so these, these top, this top row corresponds to these buoys here that are in the middle of the lake. In contrast, these ones are along the coast. We'll just kind of ignore them for now. But the biggest difference here is for the newer version of the herd that's going to go into operations later on this year, our experimental version here, is uh, we've reverted to core 3.0. And the big advantage of this is our old version of the herd had far too many low wind speed events and not enough high wind speed events compared to the OBS, which are in red. And by switching to core 3.0, we can really match that PDF of wind speeds nicely and pretty, for pretty much all stations. So that's been a big successful story for the wind speeds over lakes. And when you get that right, you have a better chance of getting your heat fluxes right over, over the lakes. And then that sets you up for the, all the, the, the recipe to get the rest of the lake effect snow events right. So this, is, this was documented by the MEG group. Uh, you can see the difference here. Uh, between these two versions of her, this one has an early version of that surface layer scheme with the revert version the core 3.0. The same microphysics scheme is used in both of these, so you can pretty much dial down all the differences to the surface layer scheme, and you can see much better uh, snowfall rates um, over 
uh, in the Lee of uh, Erie, which match up with Hobbs better. No. So that's a one nice success story. So in summary, I do have an update to the surface layer scheme. It'll be coming very soon. I had a, a crash case I fixed now, so I'll, I'll have that PR it soon. So uh, if you want to test with this, hold on until that, that commit comes in. Um, both iterative solutions I put in are fast and get, they basically give Monobokov theory the best chance, as far in my opinion. Um, the initial comparisons between the HER and GFS subcomponents, m one is a little bit uh, warmer and drier than the GFS, at least for that for that one case over the East Conus. Um, I, I do suggest we move forward with core 3.0 over lakes with our success we've had in the HER. And, you know, I don't mean to force this on the community, but I, I really do hope people jump in on this. And, and if they have other good uh, uh, formulations in mind, you know, reach out to me and Wei Zhang and we can, I can add them here and we can get them in here as, in, in this test vehicle. And uh, if all this, the only thing this does is give us a nice platform for a good apples apples comparison to figure out what's the best, then I think that's already a win. But I, at the same time, I'm going to try to make this thing as efficient as I can so it can be used in any application, real time included. But if uh, all is said and done, you know, if we, if we still want to just use Surface Diff to promote the best, most promising things and keep this as like the streamlined race car for real time use, that's uh, perfectly fine as well. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, one quick question. All right. <clears throat> there are two questions in the Slack, but uh, like Jose said, we only have time for one. Um, so from Evan Kalina, does the choice of IZ0T LND generally have a big impact on two meter temperature and dew point temperature? I saw some work by Wilson and Favel 2016 that found the cold pool scouring in the central California valleys quite sensitive to and I'm going to spell this out, and I apologize, IZ0TLND, but not sure how general this is. Um, I'm not sure about cold pools, to be honest, but, um, I mean, it can have a big impact. I mean, in general, thermal and roughness lengths can play a big role on changing your whole diurnal cycle of your temperatures uh, variation. So um, absolutely can matter. I think that uh, the options present in this scheme are you know it may seem like they vary subtly but like they like between option one and two you might not see huge changes there but i think between wei zhang's approach uh, i think uh, yeah obviously you saw pretty big differences especially over uh over uh you know lightly vegetated areas they're pretty monster differences All right, um, Joseph, there's another question for you in the Slack, so if you can uh, check that out there. Um, Has the surface scheme been tested in a UFS S2S model? The answer is not that I am aware of, probably not. Um, and then Stan asks, uh, oh, I, I guess he was somewhat answering that question. Uh, when I meant Slack, I meant um, t w uh, continue the discussion in Slack as where we have to. Yeah, okay. Continue. Okay. Please add any further question on Slack, and that's it for this session.